Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to the channel. I'm your host, Vinny Adams. I'm really looking forward to this one. It was brought brought forward a couple of days um, because Chris has been on the road and he's got loads to do and I completely appreciate that. But I didn't want to miss out, so we're doing it now and I'm not going to waste any more time. Let me introduce my guest for today's show, Mr. Chris Bartel. Chris, how you doing, man? Good, I'm doing well. Thanks for uh, taking the time and moving the schedule around. I appreciate it. Hey, my pleasure, my absolute pleasure. Uh, so, yeah, I appreciate you stopping uh, uh, on your marathon journey that you're doing. So, um, yeah, really. Do. So, listen, Chris, before we jump into sort of the more recent stuff, I'd love to just get you to sort of talk a bit about your military background, if you could. Sure. Um, I joined the uh, United States Air Force back in 1997. Uh, my first duty station was Nellis Air Force Base in 1998. Uh, served there for almost 10 years, active duty on the main base side. Uh, during that time, I was also stationed at Creech Air Force Base up, up in Nevada. I was a cadre instructor for GCTS, uh, Ground Combat Training Squadron. And then uh, around 2006, I got out of active duty status and went into the reserves until 2009. Um, in 2006, I was hired for the Department of Energy uh, for the Nevada test site as a security police officer. And I worked there for several years. And then my wife, who I met at Nellis, uh, she got orders to Maelstrom Air Force Base. And we moved up there briefly and then came back to Las Vegas. And on that way back to Las Vegas, it was during the federal hiring freeze. So I started making phone calls uh, back to Las Vegas and got hired with uh, a company who had the contract for Air 51 and worked there part-time, and then at the same time hired with Bass. But the Bass didn't know that I was working at 51 because you can't tell people that you work at 51. And then I I actually quit Bass and then went back to 51 and then went back to Bass full-time. Wow. So and then went to Skinwalker Ranch from 2010 to 2016 and then left the company in 2018 and moved to Kansas and became a federal police officer there. Wow. That's quite so, the resume. About 25 years of law enforcement, security, and cool things in the desert. Absolutely. So during your time at like Nellis and Malmstrom and that, were there ever any chatter about UFOs and things around those days? At Malmstrom, yeah. I, I heard about the, the missile stuff out there. I didn't pay much. I mean, it was interesting. But with my background and where I used to work at, I'm kind of a little bit jaded when it comes to the UAP topic. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in it. I think that's... There is something to it, you know, um, but I think a lot of the tech that we see is could be our technology that'll probably, yeah. So, I mean, I'm interested in the topic, but I'm mostly boots on the ground looking for hard evidence on the ground because I can't control it's in the skies. I have a good idea, but I can't control it's up there. I can't control it's on the ground. No, that's fair enough. And so uh, when you first started working for Bass, did you initially go straight into the ranch uh, when you were, when Bigelow employed you? Yeah, I came in at like the very end of Bass, pretty much. There was only there was only a small handful of us at the time, and I was specifically assigned to to the ranch. That was my detail. So I was there. I got hired in September. In October, I was there every month for two weeks, off and on, rotation, and uh, yeah. And so, was part of that actually study that you were doing with the ranch was part of the OSAP program. I apparently so. I wasn't aware of OSAP at the time, but yeah, I guess that was part of it. Yep. I, I didn't know about OSAP until uh, August of 19. Right. That's yeah, fair enough. Yeah. That's when I heard about it. Cool. So, you know, you were you on the ranch permanently, staying over on the ranch, living there, or was it just like you were living nearby? Yeah. No, you lived in Vegas, but you drove up, to, you got a rental car and you drove up from Vegas to. Uh, the ranch, which is about a nine hour drive. And then you stay at the ranch for two weeks and then you rotate back to Las Vegas. At the time there was, when I first got hired, there was two officers up there, myself, and another person. And then uh, I think it was late 2011. It might've been early 2011. We went to one person up there. So right. one person to secure at the time, almost a thousand acres of land. It was pretty intense. Wow, that's incredible. And so how long were you on the ranch before your the first uh, strange thing happened to you? Well, the first week I was up there, 
honestly, I'll be honest with you. I kind of just wrote it off as just another ranch, you know, cause I, I'm from a small town in Kansas, grew up on a, on a, on a ranch. We had horses and I'm very familiar with that dynamic. So that my first week up there, I was kind of like, not very impressed, you know, but I also went with a very open mind, you know, and a genuine heart. And I think that's key out there. And then the second week is when I experienced something that was pretty, that kind of caught me by surprise, which was the big canine wolf, whatever you want to call it, incident. And after that happened, it kind of changed my pers- perspective a little bit. Like there is something else going on out here. Uh, and then that led me down the rabbit hole of trying to figure it out, basically. Yeah. So could you just go into a little bit more detail on that, that canine, the, the footprints thing? Because it, you know, I know I saw it recently on the episode of Skinwalker Ranch and found it fascinating. But for anyone that might not have seen it, are you able to just talk us through it? Yeah, I'll talk, I'll give you a brief. I mean, it's a, it's very more detailed. It's, it was a pretty, it, it corresponded in like two day event basically. But at the time there was another officer up there and he reported seeing some large tracks that looked very unusual. And then we followed the tracks and it looked like it, it looked like this animal was walking on two feet for like maybe a hundred feet for like a three foot stride. And it was just bizarre. It just didn't look normal. And then we go to four feet, but they were very large tracks. And, uh, so we went out with the, the mindset, like we're going to capture this thing, <laughs> capture this thing, which is looking back now is completely ridiculous. But when you're out there, when you're out there, you just got to have to kind of, uh, adjust fire basically. And you can't be scared, you know? Yeah. And so me and my friend were like, well, we're going to go out there and try to capture this thing. And then that night we went out and and we had the dogs with us. We had three dogs at the time, two labs and a little, uh, uh, blue healer. And, um, the dogs were acting very suspicious the whole night, like very clingy. And, uh, we started backtracking our tracks back about 3 AM cause we couldn't find nothing. And then it looked like this animal had been following us the whole night. We found tracks behind our tracks. Wow. And then when we got to the corner up by Homestead One, which is now called the Triangle, which is crazy, <laughs> um, I heard this, we both heard this growl, howl, ungodly growl, and we saw this large animal, black, jump out of the ditch and run west, and we ran after it, and it disappeared. It was, it was so, the dog stopped right in the tracks and looked at us, and we looked at the dogs like, what was that? And it was a stun, you know, you just like to took the wind out of your sails. And I remember on the initial report, I didn't even write, I didn't even write that I saw it because it really freaked me out. And at the time I had an active queue clearance with the DOE still. And if you have an active queue clearance, you cannot report stuff like that or they'll, they'll yank your clearance. Yeah. So I was kind of in a rock and a hard place. I didn't know what to say. Uh, but luckily I took photograph prints of it and everything. And I kind of just kept that in my brain pan, you know, like, to, to tell a story to my kids one day and then you know back then there was no talk of a tv show or or anything but i was very interested in, in finding out the big mystery out there so yeah that led me down a whole different path no it's great i've actually got the pictures here let me just show them so yeah we can see yeah. here the the size of these prints now they're very large and uh there's and the crazy thing is Back so that happened in October of 2010, and you know I was there for almost six years or five years after that, or 2016 is my left. But I never encountered the wolf like that again, except for one time in 2015, I believe I was sitting down at the East Gate in a lawn chair with the dogs, and by by now by 2015 the ranch became like a second home. You know I wasn't scared. I was out there by myself. Sometimes I would sleep on the mesa at night because I really felt like the more I immersed myself in the environment, the more layers are being pulled back. I mean, that's yeah. how I felt like the more I really pushed myself, the more things I would experience, you know? So anyways, I'm sitting in a lawn chair and uh, behind me, my back is facing the Eastern Valley where I spent most of my time at too. I heard that same howl growl like I heard in 2010. <laughs> and I came off my chair with the gun out with a flashlight, like in a spin move. And the dogs went after it and then came right back. It was like letting me know that it was like still there, you know? And it's like, it's kind of weird because I didn't find any tracks, but there was something there that I was trying to get my attention. And that's how yeah. it worked on the ranch. When you least expect it, 
things happen. But you would think after being out there for so long, I would have thousands of stories, and it's not true. I only have a small handful of stories that I would consider uh, credible. You know, yeah, yeah, of course. You, now, you, you can let your imagination go pretty wild out there if you let it, but I, I bet, yeah. Now, we heard stories of like strange wolves right back to the, the is it the Sherman family that were there before Bigelow purchased the ranch? And they even right. said that they tried to follow some large creature and the tracks just ended in the middle of a field. And so, I guess it sort of relates to that in some way as well, yeah. I, you know, the, I didn't even read the book at first until because I didn't want to have any pre note, you know anything in my mind to kind of like perpetrate something that wasn't there. So it was a month later, I read that book, the first, uh, the hunt for uh, skinwalker. And I was, you know, the first chapter is about the wolf. And I was like, what, <laughs> you know, what is that? You know, it was, it kind of freaked me out a little bit, but um, yeah, they, 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 they probably experienced something. And there is a lot of big animals out there too. So, you know, there is big, there's mountain lions out there. There's, uh, Know, big beavers out there porcupines very large coyotes but I, I i'm used to those animals growing up in a farm you know this felt like it was something different because it was a combination of stuff going on it wasn't just a big canine it was like this thing had to jump on us the whole night and was just observing us and the dogs were acting very suspicious so it was a combination of things. It wasn't just like a one-time event. It was things leading up to a big event. And then when the event happened, it felt like I was in slow motion. Like it felt like time compressed. It was so bizarre, you know, and it, it was a strange. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of the stories, even again, dating back to the Sherman family, where, you know, there was a multitude of phenomena that were they experienced. So did you come across anything else, uh, you know, of a different type? So, you know, we've had, people talking about portals poltergeists ufos did you experience any of those things for yourself i never saw any portal stuff um ufo stuff honestly i didn't see i honestly i didn't spend much time looking at the sky because of my background i felt like i had a pretty good grasp of the sky i guess that's kind of uh dumb on my my part i should have spent more time looking at the sky um I focus more on the ground because I treated the I treated the ranch more like a crime scene, and I yeah. wanted to find real evidence to back up the data, or to back up people's extor- stories. Um, there, you know, there were several nights I would sleep on this one part of the mesa and sky watch all night long until the morning, and I I did that quite frequently with the dogs, and it was a very cool experience. Um, but I I kind of treated it more like a, with a cop mentality of like. This place is a giant crime scene. There has to be some type of residual evidence that maybe links up with people's experiences. And I was able to find some stuff, you know, but um, the poltergeist stuff. Yeah, there was a couple of things that were kind of keep your, your the hair on the back of your neck stand up, you know. But once again, trying to document it was so hard. There was one time on the western side of the property. It was me and another officer. Again, um, we were sitting there on a tree tree stump just kind of processing the day whatever it's probably about three o'clock in the morning and uh it was in the, it was in the fall it was cold and we're about to head back to homestead one and uh we heard a faint drum beat like boom 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 just just long enough for me to take out my voice recorder and hit record and it was gone maybe five seconds and it felt like it was coming deep within the tree line. So naturally, we're thinking, well, maybe there's people out here having a powwow or, you know, we're on a reservation. It's not uncommon. But when we went out to look where we heard the sounds, we heard we couldn't find anybody. And this is back in the early days where there wasn't a lot of people around the ranch. You know, it wasn't a mainstream topic. There was not many people going out there messing around. So I don't know. That's how it kind of works out there. When you least expect it, something happens. Yeah, and and then obviously you were security was your job on the ranch, but I read in one of your bios somewhere that even as security, you were your part of your job was kind of to investigate right these things and not just sort of guard the place. Let's say so. Yeah, we weren't. Yeah, there's this pre notion of like we were just some Walmart guards out there. That is not true at all. All of us out there were combat veterans, and on top of that, most of us came with. Um, clearance backgrounds, you know, yeah. and we treated the we treated the ranch like another job assignment, like I would work at the DOE, and um, but part of the job was to collect data, 
it was to secure the property, but also collect data and report anything out of the ordinary. And sometimes also, uh, you know, partake in experiments to help, you know, figure stuff out. And we did. And that's just how, that's how it was during my time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And did you have like regular sort of visiting scientists or anything like that coming onto the ranch ever? We had nobody. So there was no, so you were kind of the lead investigators. I we guess. were the scientists, the security, the ranch manager. We helped the ranch man. I mean, we were everything, but it, that's just how it was. It, and that's, and, and, and maybe that's why they wanted prior military to work more with less. That's kind of like the military motto. Um, I know. And before my time, there was a couple of scientists out there helping out and stuff. So um, during my time, I think we had one guy, but he wasn't there for very long, just little spurts. And there was other guys that would come out in little spurts and do little things, but not for long term. Nobody was out there living. And because this is and this is important for people to remember to understand what it was like being out there by yourself. OK, so you're out there all night long working, patrolling, looking for data, looking for evidence, you know, experiencing things, maybe not experiencing things. But your mind, the psychological effect of what you're being exposed to, you're aggressively mm -hmm. looking for the phenomenon. And then it's not like you go back to a hotel room and call it a day. No, you go back to Homestead One and you go and you go to sleep, and that's where it gets kind of sketchy, because now you're like, okay, I have to get some sleep sometime, and hopefully somebody doesn't get on the property and kill me, or hurt somebody, or break something, or steal something. So your mind is constantly operating in the red zone, the whole time. And you have no relief, and uh, you, that's just how it was. So yeah. just... now that's cool. And obviously, you know, we've we've got we're on the third season of the Secret of Skinwalker Ranch show now under the uh, uh, the Brandon Fugel ownership. Right. So, do you think that it looks from that series that things have ramped up more than when you were there? Oh, absolutely. Yeah they they got a, you know Brandon Fugel has provided his team a lot of support to get the job done. And that's not a knock on my previous employer. That's just how, that's just, that's, that's the truth. Um, I have no ill will towards my pre previous employer. That's just the card that was dealt. You know, you play your position. Yeah. And my position was to do what I had to do. Um, but the team that's out there now, I've been out there several times to help, you know, pass over data and information to help with the ongoing research out there. And they have incredible amount of stuff out there and equipment. And half the stuff that makes it to the TV... They're, they have so much data that only a small fraction of it makes it to the TV show. Yeah. I mean, and they so have what, so much stuff. Yeah, I was going to say, like, obviously, there's a lot of naysayers that say this is all just purely for entertainment purposes and yeah. things like that. Excuse me. And the ones who say that are the ones who never spend any time out there. I mean, let's be real here. If you want to find out what's going on and then you went to Basin, keyword, you went to Basin, not just Skinwalker Ranch. I suggest you lace up your boots and you go spend a couple of weeks out there in the desert like I just did. Yeah. And then you tell me and tell other people that it's not real because it's, it's the hole you went to Basin that's got strange phenomena and it dates back centuries. And there's petroglyphs everywhere that proves it. And that's what my biggest focus was, was related to Native American history to the phenomena. We call it the phenomena, but in indigenous history, it's called their culture. We're behind the power curve. They're way ahead of us. We're kind of going back full circle now and trying to understand what our ancient people were doing and experiencing and also trying to explain with science. Yeah. You know, I always say, you know, it's not the scientific method that matters. It's the native method that matters. Understanding that history, that is key to really, you have to, that's, you're not going to learn about Skinwalker Ranch spending a couple of days out there or anywhere out there. You have to really immerse your body and soul and spirit into that land. And that may sound like some weird shamanistic thing, viewpoint but it's true yeah and, I, and and i just spent a whole eight days with carl the crusher and james keenan and we went all over the place collecting data and 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 exploring new locations that nobody's been to before and and photographing stuff and i mean we it was so much fun but it was exhausting yeah it was a lot of fun but i am pretty tired no, I bet. Uh, Carl's actually, he, he was here a minute ago in the chat saying, Chris is the real deal, one of the few. So Yeah, I appreciate that, Carl. We had a good time. Yeah, he, Carl's the real, great, Carl's great the real deal. Carl's the real deal. What he's documenting down in southern Utah, I hope you have him on the show. He is onto something that could probably change the history books. 
Yeah, I'm serious. Yeah. I've I've uh, had quite a lot of private video chats with Carl recently. Let's say um, that much. I, I feel like he's being guided to something different, and I kind of felt like I was being guided out there on the ranch to find stuff too. It's kind of weird to, and the team that's out there now, I you know those guys are being guided for the and those who who walk in truth lead footsteps of honesty, and that's just the you have to have a genuine soul and, and a mindset when it comes to this subject. If you're out there looking to do something malicious or um, make profit or whatever. I mean, it's, there's nothing wrong with making money, but there's other people involved in this circle that have had the wrong reasons or the wrong insight and they've missed the mark. I feel bad for them because they don't get it and they never will get it. No, absolutely. And you were talking there about it being such an old and ancient kind of um, phenomena. When you were at the ranch, did you have a good rapport with the the local Utes uh, and uh, you know in the local surrounding areas? Uh, it took a, when I first got there. It was it wasn't there was there was intel that people wanted to kill us. Wow. Um, <laughs> it was it was a very uh, a very easy work environment to say the least. But over time, years and years and years, I was able to befriend a few locals and talk to them and really get some good intel and some good insight about the property that goes back way before people even sold the land. Um, but before then it was kind of sketchy for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just, you're on tribal land. It's just a different type of atmosphere. You know, you have to be respectful out there. You can't be going out there with an ego and this arrogant attitude. You really have to just be humble. And that's the key, you know, and yeah. that's kind of, and it, it helped, it helped that my mom, um, you know, she was born and raised on reservations throughout the Southwest. My grandfather used to be the project manager for a lot of reservations. So she raised me very, um, more like a Buddhist mindset with everything. Sure. And, uh, was very big on traditional history and, and, and the ancient history. And then my grandfather on my, on my dad's side, he's the one that taught me how to look for artifacts and respect the land and, you know, giving tobacco out and, and he was very uh, insightful about that type of stuff, but that didn't all click until I got to the, you went to basin and then I found myself immersed in real native culture and history everywhere. Yeah. I mean, throughout the whole basin, you have the Walker wars and the black Hawk wars, all that energy frequency and vibration is displaced in the natural environment. And, you know, I, my theory is maybe some of the negative blowback that people get around the basin is simply the fact that we are trespassing on ancient grounds or hall or sacred grounds. And just to be respectful, if you're going to go out there and explore and collect data, just have that in your mindset. Hey, I need to be respectful out here. There's something much bigger out here. And I'm glad they showed that on the TV show because yeah. the, the ranch in the Uinta Basin is bigger than my photography. It's bigger than a government contract, the science experiment, TV show, documentary. What, there is real history out there. And we were just scratching the surface of what's what we know is our reality, you know. Absolutely, yeah. Well said. I, I appreciate that a lot, definitely. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about. You mentioned there your photography. I'd love to, like, you know, if you could just talk about it. Where when you first started out with that, and some of the places you've been, and and the things that you found. Yeah, that's yeah. Um, I've always done photography since high school, right? As a hobby through my whole military career. Um, and then Las Vegas, you know, living in Las Vegas for 20 years, I have a huge portfolio of Las Vegas pictures that are probably like probably 30 to 40,000 images of Vegas from two, from 1998 to 2018. I mean, I have so many cool Vegas pictures. I need to post more of those because they're kind of neat. And then when I got to the ranch, um, I had, a you know, I did photography as a hobby, but I had a pretty good mind of, of the do's and do nots of photography. And one of the big things that caught me by surprise was when I first came out there, um, I was kind of able to help debunk some of the dust particles that were mistaken for orbs through right. flash photography. And uh, let me tell you, it didn't, I didn't make too many friends doing that. There were some guys that were pretty upset that I ex not exposed that. I was just like, hey, guys, this is not what you think it is. If you're taking a, a picture with a flash inside Homestead 2 where there's three inches of dirt and it's at night and there, there's, you're going to get tons of orbs. But if you have three dogs laying at your feet, not doing anything, the biosensors, it tells you that there's nothing there. If I'm taking a picture and there's a hundred orbs in it and the dogs are sleeping, I'm sorry, there's no energy there. It's dust particles. Yeah. But animals will animals will pick up on stuff way before we will. 
So anyways, but that's what kind of brought my camera into it because I had a better camera, a more high definition camera, and it was able to kind of clean out some of the dust particles. I would still get a couple in my camera. Yeah. And then from then on, I just carried my camera as a second piece of equipment uh, to help photograph the ranch for evidence, but also because I, I fell in love with the place and there were so many beautiful landscapes and just things I was finding. I'm like, man, I got to photograph this and just document it because I, I fell in love with the property, you know, and I'm glad I did because it was just really a story to tell my kids one day, you know. Sure. Yeah, no. And for anybody that, that wants to have a look at uh, Chris's work, obviously he posts a lot on social media, but if you go to the description below, there's a link to, uh, what's it called? I've, I've forgotten. It's a, there's a website you've got, which it, oh, yeah, uh, it Chris, showcases it. Yeah. Chris Bartel.com. And that's, uh, you also find Taras Matla's, uh, from, from the university of Maryland. Um, he, he reached out to me two years ago. He did and asked if I can donate the images to the museum. And I was like, absolutely. So I donated my whole archive to the University of Maryland, one to archive it, but for two, so other people can look at it and maybe find something that I missed, more academic my eyes on it. You know, I thought it'd be beneficial for other people to see it. Maybe they saw something that I missed or maybe something that I saw and misconstrued. They can correct me. So that was good. I'm glad I did that because it, it led to other things. Yeah, no, it's fabulous. I recommend anybody go and check that out. The link is in the description. And um, before we uh, before we move on and talk about what you've been up to for the last sort of eight days and that, yeah. I've got a couple of questions uh, in the chat there. So, yeah. uh, witness citizen Sean ha asks, "Has your worldview changed with your experiences, and if so, how?" Absolutely. Um, you know, I had a pretty good open mindset going into Skinwalker Ranch coming from my background with my mother and my upbringing, but also the areas I used to work at uh, professionally before, you know, before coming to Skinwalker Ranch, I had already worked in special access programs for major part of my career. But when you're finally out there by yourself and you're immersed in that environment, it's kind of hard. I felt I focus more on like a spiritual, spiritual evolution mindset. I felt like I evolved spiritually being out there. And I really believe my photography creativity expanded being out there. And it might be just a simple fact of being alone out there for so long that that was my only hobby to get through the, the weeks out there. But it really helped me practice my craft and, um, and then meeting some of the local people and talking about oral traditions and then going around and seeing the petroglyphs everywhere. And just the amazing, you know, that you went to base and got so much history you can almost feel the energy out there. You really can in some of these locations. Yeah. So yeah, it made me realize like, you know, people operate on different frequencies, you know, lower frequency or higher frequency. And I really feel like at the ranch, I tapped into a different frequency out there that opened my mind up a lot, a lot more, you know? Yeah. I mean, I'd love to spend time out there and, and especially meet up with you, Carl vibe and, and oh, that, you know, it'd be fun. Um, before we get into that, I've got one more question here. Yone yeah. says, did you have or still have experiences with the hitchhiker effect? Oh, so that one. So <laughs> I've only told this story like once or twice because um, it involves some family members of mine. But yeah, I did, we did have a, a hitchhiker uh, event that happened in 2011 that affected not just me, but family members as well. Um, and this is the honest truth. I talked to my mom because I didn't know what to do really. And she suggested that the next time I go to the ranch, grab sage and smudge my house. So I did that. And then shortly after that, I felt like my perception of the ranch changed because that's when I started finding artifacts and stuff. But I really believe the hitchhiker effect, uh, looking back at it now, was at the time I wasn't sure what I was doing out there. I had no direction. I was just kind of following what I was told to do. But I feel like the hitchhiker effect might be, uh, you know, you go to these areas that are sacred with lots of energy there and something attaches to you and follows you home and then presents itself as a warning, basically saying, you know, you trespass on my land. Now I'm trespassing on yours. Tread lightly. And once I kind of flipped my mind to that perception, um, everything changed. I didn't have any more hitchhiker problems. The ranch kind of felt more of a positive vibe than a negative vibe and uh that that's when everything changed for me was that event smudging the house 
and then realizing, hey, maybe I am trampling around out here on something that I, that I can't find or see yet. And that's not, and that's not, that's just the foundation of the property out there. There's other things out there too, the gilsonite and the natural occurrences out there, the magnetic anomalies. There's so many overlapping layers to the ranch and, and the new team that's out there now are really pulling back the layers. I mean, they're just, it's amazing. Some of the stuff that I watched the show and I learned things, you know, <laughs> when I was out there for a long time. But what I focused on was mostly the Native American lore and traditions and tying that into everything else. But um, yeah, so after that, I never had a problem again. So I feel like, I really feel like the ranch has this um, consciousness about it that knows if you're genuine or not. If you go out there with ill intentions, you're going to get exposed. If you go out there with a genuine heart, you're going to be okay. You got, And I used to tell people, you know, if you're, if you're looking for darkness on the ranch, you can find it. Trust me. But if you're looking for light on the ranch, you can find that as well. And that's what I focused on was the light through my photography. And, yeah. um, but I had people that I knew that ranch tear them apart, you know? Um, yeah. Wow. I really appreciate you sharing that. I really do. Cause I know, like you said, you've not told that before and, uh, yeah, I feel honored for you to open I'm, up I'm, like that. I'm, really I'm a lot more, I'm a lot more open now about some things than before, because I wasn't sure what I could and couldn't say about, you know, having a clearance and stuff. But now it's like, I don't feel like I need to hide anything anymore because it's the truth and yeah. I can back it up with, with evidence and, and documentation. You know, I this I mean, this is the problem with, with some of these places you have, people that have this perception that, you know, it's Skinwalker Ranch or it's another location and they can write whatever story they want and everybody's going to blindly believe it because, well, there's already uh, a, a reputation there. Mm. But has anybody fact-checked those stories? And I really try to, I try to be truthful as much as I can. And there was a time on Skinwalker Ranch where I just stopped reporting stuff altogether. I did because nobody cared. Nobody cared that I reported things and the, the company went into a different mindset of focusing more on the aerospace side of the house. But that doesn't mean the phenomena stopped out there at all. But most of us that who were left out there, we just stopped reporting things because it seemed like nobody really cared. Yeah. And so why am I going to waste time reporting a bunch, a bunch of crazy stuff when nobody's listening? So at that point, you're just like, well, I'm here just on a spiritual evolution or a spiritual journey, basically. That's how I you know, looked at it. So that's kind of was my focus amazing yeah i can understand yeah so let's talk about this trip that you you're literally on your way back from right well, now yeah how did that come about so me and james keenan for last we've been doing this thing every year we try to make it a point to go out to the uinta basin and spend a good five days this time it was over a week and really explore new things out there and kind of tie it all together uh james keenan that guy has a wealth of information and he does his research and he has scientific equipment to back up the data. And he doesn't go just here. He's, he goes all over the country, all over the place. And he goes to these places sometimes by himself and spends the time and energy. And so I kind of follow James's lead on these events as the second guy with, I, with my photography and with my experiences. And, and uh, Carl was with us on this trip. And he has a, he's on the level two. He's tapped into that frequency, frequency as well. And, you know, his ability to see petroglyphs and he's got a great eye for that. I mean, he really does. He's being guided too, I think. And I think he's just started his research and the Magic Mesa down in Southern Utah. And I cannot wait to see what he finds. I'm, I, hopefully I get to go out there this year and spend a couple of days out there because I can't wait to photograph that area and see what I find as well. And so, yeah, we go out there and, and just explore all over the Uinta Basins and, and go to uh, new locations and we talk to the locals around the area and find out uh, stories about this place. So we go out there and spend a night and see if we could find anything. And some nights it's a bust. Some nights it's like, Whoa, something is out here, you know? And uh, it was pretty fun. This time we went from, we went from going to an inactive volcano wow. <laughs> to going underground in the cave systems in a matter of <laughs> two days. And then, uh, just hiking everywhere, going to see new petroglyphs and McKee Springs and, and, uh, just kind of going where the wind blows us, I guess we would just go, Hey, let's go here and check it out. And sure enough, we'd find something like, wow, you know, and I photo, I have like 4,000 images. I have to go back and really dissect and see 
what we missed or what we saw because some of the some of the places we went to the, the weather was kind of super windy or it was raining a couple of days and so you're kind of rushing through to, to, to get to find stuff and uh it was a lot of fun wow it sounds fun. it i, I can't, I've, I've said to carl like i've said to a lot of people when i come out to the states i'll definitely be paying them a visit but i really yeah. hope i get to to visit utah both the north and the south you know maybe brandon or let us few of us come to skinwalker ranch you know oh yeah that'd be awesome i think you you know getting out there and kind of absorb some of the energy out there um i think it, it's it surprises a lot of people because the tv show kind of pay, you only see a little bit of what what the whole basin offers yeah and there's so many beautiful areas out there it's just no wonder people were naturally drawn to that location it's gorgeous yeah and have you been up to them is it mcconkey ranch there they've got the petroglyphs in that yeah, uh, we've been to McConkie Ranch a couple times, and they got some amazing petroglyphs out there. Go back to the Fremont era, you know. And then we went to McKee Springs. It's another place that's got amazing glyphs as well. And that was really fun, too, going up in those hills and, and finding those glyphs. And it's everywhere you look out there, you just wonder, is there one out there I missed? Or, you know, because there's still so much out there that's being discovered every day, you know. Yeah. That's what's exciting about it. So, before we before we wrap up i wanted to know if you've got anything planned for the rest of the year obviously you're going back to work and your normal life but uh, anything right. that you've got coming up as well yeah actually uh i got a project coming out i think it's coming out at the end of this month with taras Mala, nice um, for the university of maryland it's a little mini documentary that we shot last year when i was in dc i was in uh, washington dc twice last year and uh we shot this little mini documentary kind of going over the photography of skinwalker ranch and explaining some of my experiences in more in detail and i've only seen like a rough cut of it but it's very well done and it's kind of cool because it's me telling my story on my own without being you know chopped up in production or whatever yeah. and it really focuses more of what my intentions were and how my photography has evolved since then and so i really can't wait to see it and for other people to see it and it'll, it'll be free online it'll be it's an academic project so it, it'll be free on youtube and on the Maryland's uh, university website and I'll have it on my website. So it's just more history about the uh, beautiful area of, of Skinwalker and, and the surrounding areas. So I hope people enjoy it. I'm sure they will. I can't wait to see it. I mean, I'm so fascinated by everything in, in those, in those areas. So I, I'm sure it'll be amazing. Yeah. Um, before we go, yorna has got another great question. Sure. She says, is the energy around or close to the petroglyphs different than the rest of the area? Yes, that is. As a matter of fact, Carl has done a good job documenting it with uh, magnetic detectors and EMF reads, and reads and um, equipment that shows that there is something that, that some of these glyphs are are producing different types of magnetic anomalies. There is something there, absolutely. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. I mean, I really hope Carl continues on this journey because, like I said, I've spoken to him a lot about it, and he's definitely working in the right direction to finding some incredible things. oh he's on the right path that's for sure yeah well listen chris thank you so much for taking your time out of your drive i know you said you've got about another 13 hours ahead of you um uh, i don't yeah, i don't is, envy you there <laughs> this is a nice break and that's why i want to do this interview while things were still fresh in my mind and i didn't go back to going back to dad and and back to my job so i'm glad we were able to work it out and i really appreciate your time and allowing me to to tell some of my stuff uh, you're welcome. Absolutely. Anytime, man. I really, I really mean that genuinely. I cannot thank you enough, man. So please stay in touch. I look forward to seeing your little documentary that's coming out. Yeah. So yeah. Nice All right. Well, take, take care. Thank you, man. Speak soon. Safe journey. Yep. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Well, guys, that was amazing. I really, really appreciate Chris literally stopping mid journey to come and talk to, to me uh, and answer questions. Uh, and he, he did say he's got another 13 hours of driving. So, yeah, I know how hard that is. Um, so, guys, thank you so much for being here in the live chat. Uh, I'm hoping to maybe do a video this weekend. I'm going to be at the Awakening Expo in Blackpool. Uh, it's this big conference that's happening. I'm going to be there with a lot of my colleagues from UAP Media UK. So I'm thinking about making some kind of video possibly even doing some kind of live stream. I've not decided yet. I'm going to check to see what the the signal's like when I'm up there. So, you know, look out for something. I will be posting a lot across my social medias while I'm there. Yeah, and then next week, 
I have got, uh, who am I joined by? Steve Bassett is coming on on the 29th, but I have today just arranged for the full cast of the upcoming phenomenology documentary that I was a part of in Colombia. We're going to do a big panel discussion on the 28th. So I'm looking forward to that. So again, go over to my Instagram, my Twitter. You can keep uh, keep up with all the announcements there. So yeah, thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate you being here. Enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.